G'day, remember me? Uh, I've got some housekeeping to get through, but uh, today's video is going to be about stacking. Today's main video is going to be about different stacking algorithms. How do the different algorithms stack up and what do the different programs offer? I'm going to do an experiment where I stack my data in a bunch of different ways in a bunch of different programs and see if there is any particular stacking algorithm or program which stands out above the others. So, my name is Dylan O'Donnell and you're watching Star Stuff. Okay, so a few things for housekeeping before I get to the main video. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who uh, commented on the last video and congratulated me on finishing my uni degree. I have a whole bunch of letters after my name now, which is great for my massive ego. And I expect all of you to call me master from this point forwards. But of course, having finished the degree, uh, I just took a couple of weeks off to just drink a lot of beer and hang out. So I went to Queensland and did some Queensland things which was nice. But the weather here has been ridiculous. Uh, it's not just the weather and it's not just the moon and I don't want to be an astronomer that complains a lot but Australia is literally on fire. And that's very inconvenient for me being an astronomer but it sure as hell is a lot more inconvenient for people and animals who burn to death. So I don't really have much to complain about there. Now on the last video where I talked about the exposure lengths and I was doing a one-to-one -one comparison, a few of you correctly pulled me up on one point and I do appreciate it when you pull me up on things. I do highly recommend you look in the comments after my videos and if I've said something wrong or if someone has suggested something better, I will pin that comment to the top of the video. There are a few comments about how when you take shorter exposures, the strategy should be to increase the gain compared to a long exposure. And in my experiment, I used the same gain setting across all exposures, which I think was a good scientific test because it is a one-to-one -one test against that. ISO and gain, just so you understand them, is essentially a multiplying of the pixel values. So if a pixel is one and you use gain to increase that by a certain value, then it might go from one to four. And all you're doing is multiplying that by four but it also means that all the rest of the noise in that image also gets multiplied by four. So all the noise comes up at the same value that the signal does. And that's why simply boosting the ISO on your camera is in theory, not doing anything because in post you can multiply those values anyway, and you can increase the levels and pull in the histogram so that you're increasing the signal, but you're also increasing the noise at the same time. So gain and ISO in and of itself isn't a panacea to getting more signal. However, there is a type of noise called read noise, which doesn't get amplified by that gain. So if you take lots of shorter exposures and you do have a higher gain setting, you won't get an increase on that read noise, but you will get an increase on all the other noise anyway. So I still stand by the experiment in that longer exposures are ideal if you can get them. However, there is a case to be made that that video didn't really explain that if you do have to use shorter exposures, if you're in a light polluted area or for some reason you can't get those longer exposures, there is a strategy where you can bump up the gain, have shorter exposures, get lots of them and then stack them. And that will go some way to getting the same level of detail that you would with many long exposures as well. The next bit of news is that I have an article, or at least I contributed to an article by David Brodie, which is coming out on space.com, which is reviewing the Celestron Rasa 8, which is still one of my favorite telescopes. Apologies for not being around again, but I did do a hangout with Fraser Kane where I went through some of the history of astrophotography and the history of photography in astronomy. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, I do recommend looking at that hangout. And final bit of housekeeping before I get into the main video is uh, my video about Tesla uh, and whether it's a good car for astronomers. I've had a, a few people subscribe to the channel who are into Tesla uh, and they know I drive a Tesla now and it's been, it's literally the best car ever made. I've got to say, I've never driven in a car this amazing and I don't think I can drive any other car now. Now, um, 
obviously Elon Musk has announced the Cybertruck and everyone's jaws hit the floor mostly because of how weird it looks it really does look weird and I have to admit um, I bought a bunch of Tesla stock before the Cybertruck announcement I was sitting there with Anna watching the car roll out and both of us just thought what have we done <laughs> oh my fucking god oh god what have we done um, and then the windows got smashed and we watched the stock fall and uh, we were a bit worried but the stock is back to where it was before in fact Tesla stock is now higher than ever before I have put a reservation down for the Cybertruck the Cybertruck sort of addressed every issue I had in the Model 3 astronomy video uh, particularly that I want a PowerPoint when I'm out there doing astronomy at night time uh, the Cybertruck has a PowerPoint but it also has an air compressor so I can uh, you can use that for the tires obviously but I can use it to pump up a bed pump up a mattress uh, it's going to be great for camping it's going to be great for the fact that I'm going to have two teenage boys at some point and this is a six-seater vehicle uh, plus all the space in the tray there's enough space for um, massive telescope expedition and you you got all your power and if you get the long range version it's going to have more than enough range to get out and about really in the outback here in australia so i'm very excited for the cybertruck so for the main video this is what i'm going to do i'm going to test with deep sky stacker which is the freely available stacker program i'm going to test with nebulosity which is the first stacking program that i used and i'm going to test with pix insight which is the stacking program that i use now now this might come as a surprise, but I've never actually used Deep Sky Stacker before. Is that how you do it? I have no idea. How do you open a goddamn list of <laughs> how I stack them? <laughs> do you actually have to check all of them? Okay, that worked and uh, that's it unstretched, but the stack looks great, really. Um, looks just like what I'd get out of anything else. I'll compare them for you properly on the screen after I do all this. Uh, I can see now there are some options in here. We're just going to use the straight average in here. There are other algorithms to choose from though. Okay, so when talking about the different stacking algorithms, I should mention that averaging is the default for all of these programs for good reason. It is the best method for stacking light frames. Of course, it works best with the more data you have. But to make those algorithms even better, there's usually an option for something called sigma clipping or some kind of rejection method. Uh, to enable stricter rejection, you want to use sigma clipping or Windsorized sigma clipping in PixInsight, uh, which is good for getting rid of those outliers. So say you've got some Starlink satellite BS running through your images and you need to uh, get rid of them. This is why we have sigma clipping and you'll notice other algorithms like median or minimum or maximum but these things are more specialized and they're uh, usually for things like flats and other calibration frames uh, you generally don't want to use median minimum or maximum most of the time you're going to want to use average like I said it's the default for good reason okay let's try this again with nebulosity now we've got a lot of stacking options here but again I'm just going to use average which should be basically exactly the same as what we have anyway let's just stack these Okay, now I'm going to try stacking in image integration in PixInsight, more or less the same as what you get in Deep Sky Stacker, but with just a few more options. And we also have options here for pixel rejection. Percentile clipping here in PixInsight and this is Deep Sky Stacker. And I've got to say, I think I think Deep Sky Stacker did the better job. And there even seems to be a little more contrast, but a little bit of data washed out in this one compared to this one. So at least for the 10 image test, I am going to declare the winner here as Deep Sky Stacker, especially for free software. I'm sure with a bit of tweaking, Pix Insight would have the control to get an equivalent image out of 10, but that is a surprising result, I've got to say. Well done, Deep Sky Stacker. Well, what an upset that was. For a large enough quantity of subs, it's pretty much on par. I mean, DSS and Pix Insight come up with the same result. I'm sure with larger data sets, where you want to be a little bit more specific with the tweaking of the stacking algorithm, the difference would be clear then. 
Uh, however, I was really surprised that Deep Sky Stacker performed better with less subs. Just with my eyeballs, I could see the difference in Deep Sky Stacker's result, particularly in the dark areas. They just appeared less noisy. Well done, Deep Sky Stacker. That was a bit of a surprise. Hope you enjoyed this video. You don't have to uh, like or subscribe. It really doesn't make a difference at the end of the day because everything is meaningless and we're all going to die.